Okay, we're going to transition now to some cross-cultural perspectives on sickness and dying. And this will involve two case studies in particular, um, involving poverty and high infant mortality rates. The first of these is um, Dr. Nancy Shipper Hughes's work um, within Brazil. So she's a social sociocultural anthropologist. She uses ethnography and participant observation. So she's living and within the community. Stays she was staying within um, Alto de Crucero, Crucerio in uh, Bom Jesus in Brazil. This was an impoverished sugar plantation region, and she was actually interviewing mothers who had had um, a child die. Case, one fact about the case study in general, one million deaths of children per five years were, ha were occurring in Brazil at this time. So she was particularly intrigued by mothers' apparent a different indifference toward the death of their children. Um, young infants, it seemed, were just expected to die. The many of them were sick or malnourished, um, and the mothers tended to view these children as wanting to die. So their efforts tended to focus more on survivors than on those children that were perceived as not wanting to live. Because of the high risk of death, mothers avoided feelings of love for their infants from, from until a certain age had been reached. Um, very often midwives and healers would provide advice about which children should be allowed to die and which ones should have more focus in terms of resources available. The funerals, when they did occur, tended to be short and simple. The graves were not marked and were never really visited after the, chi the child had died. Because of the extremely poor economic conditions, this practice of selective neglect of in infants may have actually been a survival strategy within this community. Providing the most resources to the healthiest children increased their chance of survival. Also, the mothers were helping themselves by reducing their burden of grief that came along with the loss of a child. So if we look at some of the factors involved in this particular case study, we can look at social organization and stratification. This is a highly stratified and impoverished country. These mothers were given very little support. Even the cost of the coffins themselves were not really subsidized, so you can imagine not wanting to put much effort or time into the funerals. The ideology itself was Roman Catholic. This helps to normalize the death of childs. Children were seen as being adverse to life. And again, this sort of attitude was what helped women to deal with this difficulty. In terms of identity themselves, these women are seen as mothers, caretakers, and providers. This concept of love, though, was held on to until, again, a certain point in the child's life had been reached. These practices were shaped by the experiences these women had. So if you lost a child earlier on in your life, you knew to prepare yourself better for the possibility of losing another. Health factors as well were also very important. Life expectancy was really only about 40 years. Disease was prevalent across these communities. <clears throat> So in terms of institutionalization and routinization of death at all levels of society, uh, the church was involved in this. Doctors tended to ignore the clear malnourishment of children um, because there just weren't enough resources to go around. In this case, that denial of death, no church ceremonies for the dead children were held. There were no baptisms if they were considered to be dying or, again, adverse to, to life. And because of this, the women were just seen as carrying on. You know, Death Without Weeping is the title of her article. I have a link to it in the additional materials um, because they just couldn't provide themselves with the opportunity to even really mourn. So the selective neglect of influence, again, is some sort of survival strategy. It allowed the mothers to focus their most resources down their healthiest children reduce their own burden of grief, and unfortunately med medical and religious workers enabled these feelings of indifference towards their dead children. Okay, the second case study then um, takes place in West Africa, 
that's the work of Dr. Jotina Einer's daughter in Guinea-Bissau. And she examined attitudes toward grief and infant death as well. And she was working in what are called the Papel communities in this country. Guinea-Bissau is one of the poorest countries in the world, but among the Papel, fertility and child mortality is very high and poverty is often extreme. So in this case, we're seeing 337 out of 1,000 children dying before the age of five. Despite their poverty and high levels of infant mortality, the Papel mothers grieved, grieved deeply for their infants. This is very different than from what we saw in a Brazilian case. Um, Papel mothers feel shame and sadness when forced to neglect their young children for cultural or economic reasons. Uh, the determination and neglect from an outside perspective is very difficult for us to understand. Even in cases that seem outwardly similar, human groups across space and time can approach the dying process very differently. So that should be one of the, the take-home messages in comparing these two cases. You know, the outcomes are very similar, but the experience, the emotion, the behaviors associated with this sort of loss are quite different across these two different societies. So we're really challenging the idea that extreme poverty and high infant mortality necessarily decrease motherly love toward their young children. We can't say that this is the case. Instead, what we can say are that cultural beliefs largely shape attitudes toward death despite similarities in economic or health situations. In the Papel case of Africa, grief over death of infants is severe and prolonged, whereas in Brazilian, in the Brazilian shanty towns, we see that prolonged grieving is um, an inappropriate behavior and is just not practiced.